Well, today is this Shabbos is a very special Shabbos. It's the 70th anniversary. The Rebbe officially became Rebbe in 1951. It's the yard site, the 71st yard site of the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe. And um, it's on Shabbos. He passed away on Shabbos. Shabbos Parshas Boy in the morning. And um, here we are, 71 years later. And uh, one of the last Fabrengel that the Rebbe Fabrengel spoke, um, I think it was 1992, Parshas Boy, could be 91 and 92. The Rebbe asked the question, why is the name, everything is in the Hebrew name. What's the name of this week's Torah portion? Boy. Why does it say boy? All the commentaries ask. In Hebrew, it should have said leich, go. Boy means come, come to pare, meaning come, come with me. Hashem is sending him as his, as his messenger. He should have said leich, go, go to pare. So he says boy, and that becomes the name of the Torah portion because boy, it says that the Zayar says, that Moshe Rabbeinu was terrified. He was afraid. Up until now, he met Parai outside, outside of his palace. Parai would sneak out of his palace every morning. He proclaimed himself as, as God. And the proof that he was God, he never relieved himself. So he says, you see, I'm not human, I'm God. But he would do, he'd wake up early in the morning <laughs> when everyone was asleep and he would go out, out of town, out of the city to relieve himself so he could pretend to play God. And that's what Maisha caught him and found him in his, in his shame. In his, and that's where he spoke when he, were, when he was vulnerable. And that's where he spoke to him and gave him all the, warned him for all, all the upcoming uh, plagues. Here, Hashem says, when it comes to the eighth plague, Hashem says, pare, go to pare in his palace, while he is in his palace, in his throne room, in the room within the room, which only the king is allowed to sit. And pare was an awesome and mighty king. And Medrash describes the terror of even walking into pare's palace and surrounded by guards and soldiers and lions. And it was just a terrifying experience. And Pare was a powerful, and mighty, mighty figure. Pare was king of Egypt, king of ego. <laughs> he had the world's largest ego. And you see how tough he was. Plague after plague, and he stubbornly doesn't bend. He's not impressed. He doesn't surrender, not so fast. The first five plagues, on his own, he just was tough, couldn't care less. Didn't let him change his mind. He wasn't fickle, you know. Most of us change, we can change our mind in a, in a nanosecond. <laughs> He's not changing his mind so fast. One plague, two plagues, three plagues, four plagues, five plagues. Not so fast. So you see, he was a very powerful king, king of ego, arrogant. Moshe was afraid to walk into his room, his chamber, when he's at the height of his might and strength and power. Hashem says to Moshe, boy, come, come with me. I'm going to go with you. Don't be afraid. I am with you. We're coming together. And that becomes the name of the Torah portion. The Torah portion that we're going to read in tonight, tonight's, tomorrow's reading, the sixth reading, we read of the Exodus. On this day, the Jewish people marched out of Egypt in broad daylight. No one could stop them. Three million men, women, and children. This was genuinely an iron curtain. A single slave couldn't leave Egypt, escape. And here, three million men, women, and children, former slaves walk out in broad daylight, unconditional surrender, 
So the whole, the main theme of this Torah portion is the Exodus from Egypt. What's the name of the Torah portion? Boy, which signifies. Moshe was afraid to go, and Hashem had to tell them, don't be afraid, boy, I'm coming with you. We're going together. He didn't say, Leich, go, come, come with me. And that's the name of the Torah portion that we read about the Exodus. So the Rebbe explains that in order to be free from Egypt, Egypt had to be broken. First, you have to break Egypt. You have to break the shell, the arrogance. It's like a husk. It's like a, a hard nut to crack. You can't access the nut until you crack the shell. It was a very hard crust. But you have to break Egypt. You have to break the hubris. You have to break the arrogance. And that's why that was the key. That was the key to the Exodus. That was essential for Moshe to go in Pare, where Pare is in his might, in his own palace, at home, in his, in his innermost chamber, sitting on his throne of glory. And that's where Hashem says to Moshe, boy, we're going to go to Pari. In the height of his strength, of his might, of his power and his might. And that's where you're going to break it. That's where you're going to crack it. You know, nothing can grow. In order for something to grow, to sprout, First, it has to reach a level of nothingness. When you plant a seed, you plant a seed on your table and you water it and the sun shines. You bring the table to the window and the sun shines. Nothing is going to grow. Because the seed remains happily a seed. It's only when you plant a seed in the earth and the seed rots and the seed loses its identity and disintegrates. That's what unleashes. Then you can grow, then you can grow something from nothing. But you can't get to something from something. There has to be a nothing in between. There has to be a moment of nothingness. So in order to How about you froze? Rabbi, you froze. Unmute yourself, Rabbi. <laughs> You know, you're the first person that asked a rabbi to unmute himself. <laughs> Most people ask the rabbis, please mute yourself. <laughs> but this is the, especially when we sense that our egos, our hubris, our own personal egos and hubris, sometimes it gets out of control. Our heart is hardened. We don't feel empathy. We couldn't care less. Stop caring. Stop getting emotionally involved. 
and we just become impossible, almost inhumane. Because when we go so haughty, when we get so haughty, arrogant, out of touch with reality, what's the sign that we're out of touch with reality? When you're out of touch with other people. You know, we can delude ourselves that we are very much in touch with reality. But there's one sign, there's one moment of truth. If we're out of touch with other people, then we know we're out of touch with reality. And, and we're completely delusional. So the moment where we know that we're in touch, and that's how we know, it's interesting. The Kohen Gadol, the highest, the holiest Jew, on the holiest day of the year in Yom Kippur, in order for him to enter into the Holy of Holies, which is the whole essence of the service of Yom Kippur, it, he must be a married person. All year round, it's not such a criteria. It's not a criteria. But on Yom Kippur, he must be married. Why? You're not allowed to have relations on Yom Kippur. As a matter of fact, the high priest would set, they would separate him from his wife for seven days. Take, he would leave his house and live in the temple for seven days before. There was no marital relations. He was out of the house. So why is it so critical? It must, that he must be a married man. You would think the high priest should be some, some monk, Lahavdil, some, you know, meditating, who's isolated, who's spiritual, so spiritual and so pure and so holy. He has no connection to the material world. And yet, this is the criteria. Without that, he is invalidated. He's not allowed to be a high priest. He's not allowed to do the service in the Yom Kippur. So much so, according to one opinion, you have to prepare a second wife, just in case his wife dies on Yom Kippur. Maybe she'll die from fright. She doesn't know if he's, he, if he's going to make it out. She knows if he's a tzaddik or not. <laughs> she knows the truth. That's one person you can't lie to is your own spouse. So maybe she's worried that he's not going to make it. She'll die from, from a heart attack. <laughs> So you have to prepare immediately. He has to have ready in his wings that he should immediately marry and have be married. Why? Why is it so important? And the answer is because that's the acid test. The acid test is our human relationship. You know, there are four parts of the code of Jewish law. Or Chaim, how we live our life. Chayshin Mishpat, civil law, business law. Yeridea, what's kosher, what's not kosher, what's allowed, what's not allowed. And Evan has marital law. And the previous Rebbe once said, commented, Evan has this is the acid test. Because how do we know that a person is in touch with reality? If we're in touch with those around us, if we're in touch with people, with other people. If we're not in touch with other people, that means we're not in touch with Hashem, we're not in touch with reality, we're not in touch with ourselves. <laughs> we're not in touch with the truth. So when a person is experiencing a pare moment, we feel like king of ego, haughty, supercilious, arrogant, full of hubris, holier than thou, judgmental, harsh, intolerant. And any human weakness, imperfection, of course, in others. then you have to break that. In order to achieve an exodus, in order that there should be a movement, a change, there has to be a boy of pare moment. You have to break, you have to break, break that arrogance. Because if a person, if we're not in touch with the core basic truths, 
of what's real and what's not real. If we can't figure it out, if we can't figure out the reality of Hashem, the ultimate truth, that Hashem is with us, if we don't realize that Hashem is with us, Hashem is coming with us, Hashem is with us, if we can't figure out the truth and reality of Hashem, which is located at the very core and center of our being, if we are delusional about our own truth, the ultimate truth, the absolute truth, the only truth that really matters, that our whole being and our whole core and essence is nothing other than godliness, than Hashem, how in the world could we figure anything out? How are we going to figure out ourselves? Surely, how can I figure out someone else? It's not possible. So to have a genuine relations with others, it first has to start with having a genuine relation with Hashem. But in order to have a genuine relation with Hashem, as well as with others, there has to be this element of brokenheartedness in a healthy sense. To break the arrogance, the... the the smugness, the foolish sense of self-satisfaction. This brokenness is a wonderful thing. It was once a beautiful story with the second Lubavitcher Rebbe, the middle Rebbe. So in the life of his father, the Alter Rebbe, he was like the Mashpia. He was he used to fabreng with the Hasidim and the young Hasidim especially. And once he was fabringing with the Hasidim, and there was one Hasid, and he was really like putting him down or putting him in his place. Like, this is called serving Hashem. Your davening is not a davening. This is, this is how you serve Hashem. It was all done. It was very sharp and very demanding, but it was all done out of tremendous love and care. You know, when people in America today say, I love, it's enough to give you the chills. <laughs> what, they're telling, what they're telling you is, I don't care, you jump off a bridge, let me jump off a bridge, you don't bother me, I don't bother you, you kill yourself, I'll kill myself, I couldn't care less, just leave me alone, I'll leave you alone, and that's what people call love today. You know, it's enough to give you the chills. If you tr truly care about someone, you care about them. And if you see them jumping off the bridge, you're going to stop them, you're not going to let them jump off the bridge. You do whatever it takes. You get involved and it bothers you. So this is all, this demanding was very done out of tremendous love, but it was very demanding and very tough. And this Hasid re responded to the middle of the Rebbe. He says, he says, how could you compare the two of us? He says, let me explain to you. Firstly, where did I come from? It came from a putrid drop. Who knows what my parents were thinking when they conceived me? I can just imagine what they were thinking already. <laughs> and I'm the result of that. So you can imagine which level of heaven they brought my soul down to earth, what kind of soul they brought down to earth, from which, you know, it wasn't from the high reaches of heaven. It was, uh, you know. And then you know how I make a living? I have to go around to all, this was in Russia, at least in Europe, I have to go to all the farms, I have to sell them things. So you have to come very early in the morning. You know, the farmers wake up early. So four in the morning, I'm there and you know, you can't talk business with a Russian peasant before you take out some vodka, some lechayim. And of course, it's not just the farmer is there, his wife is there. So we're sitting at 4 a.m. and I have to drink with them and I'm drinking with them and we're talking business and farming and we're talking business and I collect, hopefully I collect something they owe me or whatever. And I do this for a few hours and then it's time to go daven. And then I go daven. So he says, you can, so you can imagine what kind of davening, what kind of, uh, how my davening looks already. After spending a few hours hanging out and fabringing with all the, the, the peasants, the, the, the shikses and the goyim and, and, the, and the hicks and I'm drinking with them. You know, you can imagine what kind of davening my davening is. What do you want from, what do you expect? 
He says, you, now, verse, by the way, this guy was actually a very big chassid. He daven, his davening was very special. <laughs> yeah, he happened to be a very, very special Jew. But he was just putting himself down. He says, you, the Mittler Rebbe, you know, you can just imagine what your father, the Alter Rebbe, was thinking that holy moment when he was intimate, and who knows what intent he had, and who knows, he drew you down, he drew your soul down from the highest levels of heaven, you know, I mean, so what are you comparing you to, to me? The middle of he heard this, he became, he was completely broken. He took it to heart. And he went running to the Alter Rebbe. He, for a private audience, his father and his Rebbe. His Rebbe, my whole service of Hashem is nothing. This is called service of Hashem. I, what's the big deal that I daven and I'm learning? You know, everything that the other chassid told him. When the chassid came to the Alter Rebbe later, the Alter Rebbe thanked him. The Alter Rebbe says, I want to thank you for making my barrel, for making my eldest son into a chassid. Because as holy as you are, as wholesome as you are, as great as you are, unless you feel you experience that brokenheartedness, shattered, broken, in, in, a, in a healthy way. In other words, your delusions are shattered. Our self-delusions are shattered. Our sense of complacency is shattered. And instead, we feel this urgency Suddenly we feel this hunger, hunger to learn, hunger to grow. You can't achieve an exodus if you're not an exile. <laughs> if we don't feel that you're in exile, then what kind of exodus? <laughs> exodus, exile, exodus is an answer to a problem. If you have no problem, then everything is hunky-dory and everything is wonderful and we're coasting along and we're so proud and smug and content. If we're like a stone, this coming week is too bishvat. We'll discuss it next week. But if we're like a stone, next Thursday, if we're like a stone, you know, someone, someone wrote, wrote to the Rebbe, he says, well, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a good Jew. I'm married. I have two children. I support, uh, you know, I give money to the Jewish causes. I, 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 what more could I do? I was like, the Rebbe said, the Rebbe responded, are you like a stone? A stone doesn't move, doesn't budge, stays in one place, is happy, there's no growth, there's no sign of life. There's no restlessness. How could there be an exodus if there's no restlessness? If there's no agitation, if there's no pressure, if there's no urgency, if there's no... The seed has to be crushed. The seed has to be dissolved. The seed has to rot. The seed has to lose itself. There has to be pressure. There has to be this integration. Then that seed can flourish into a lush, a lush tree. But to get from point A to B, there has to be a moment of nothingness in between. That's all real growth, all real education. Comes all real learning is there's a moment of, of nothingness. You remember when you first learned how to swim? It was a very terrifying moment. Because there has to be a moment when you leave the solid ground and you let go. And you're floating in the water. You don't know how to swim. You don't know. And that's when you learn. <laughs> it's like you probably remember the first time you drove. And you drove on a highway. You, you, you thought you are going to die. <laughs> Cars rushing all around you. You're terrified to death. But that's the moment. If, if there's no moment, if there's no such moment, there's no transition. There's no leap. There's no learning. There's no change. There's no transformation. You can't really learn. You have to let go. You have to let go of your comfort zone. There has to be that moment of pressure, that moment of, of anxiousness where you're, 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 you don't know. And, and that's the spurt 
That's what gives us the spirit of growth. So whenever we feel a parry moment, when we feel very arrogant, our ego is out of control, our smugness and self-satisfaction and arrogance is out of control. And the proof is how we treat other people. We become intolerant of other people. We have no patience for other people. We see all, only the negativity in other people. That means that we're out of touch. We're out of touch with ourselves. We're surely out of touch with Hashem. And therefore, we're out of touch with what's right in front of us, with reality, with everything that's all around us. All it takes to block out reality is put one finger in front of your eyes. That's all it takes. Oh, Steve is doing it. <laughs> you put one finger in front of your eyes and that's it. Suddenly, the world goes dark. I don't see anything. The beautiful world is out there. I don't see. That's all it takes. Our ego, our arrogance becomes, we block, we put a finger in front of our eyes. It's the shutting of the mind. The closing of the mind. There's never been a generation like ours that has so much information. It's astounding. It's astonishing. The information the awareness, level of awareness and information that's available at our fingertips. And yet, we've never experienced such a closing, a shutting down of the mind, a total closing down of reality, shutting ourselves, shutting reality out, truth, reality. Total shutdown, absolute ego. Paro, king of ego, king of Egypt, absolute hubris, arrogance, chutzpah. Whether you don't see Hashem, you don't see anyone around you, and you don't see Emes. It's right in front of us. And this beautiful world, instead of seeing this world as the beautiful world that it is, as the Garden of Eden that it is, instead we view the world as a jungle. We're in Paro's world, the mighty enslave the weak and live off their slavery. Egypt was so corrupt, so hopelessly corrupt. That's why Moshe told, tells Paro, let my people go for three days. We want to serve Hashem for three days. He never said only three days. He never lied. <laughs> he never said only for three days. He said three days, let us go serve. And Paro wouldn't even let him go. Ten plagues. It took ten plagues. Only by the tenth plague, Parok was crushed, surrendered unconditionally, and said, whatever you want. Take everything. But up until that point, he wouldn't even let them go. For th They've been working. They've been in Egypt for 210 years. They've been working hard for 116 years. They've been bitterly enslaved for 86 years. What's Moshe asking? Give us three days off. Okay, Moshe already instituted that they shouldn't work on Shabbos. When Moshe was the prince, prince of Egypt, he already instituted, that's why we say in the davening of the Shemun in Shabbos, Yismach Moshe, Matmas Chalke. We talk about Shabbos, Moshe had a special connection because he convinced Padre to give the Jews a day off. So they, instead of being enslaved seven days a week, they were enslaved six days a week. But Moshe was asking, just let them go for three days. He wouldn't even let them go for three days. What do you mean? I own them. I control them. They're mine. They're my slaves. Why would I give them off? They're nothing to me. They're just a means to an end, to enrich me. This was the society of Egypt with the weak lorded over others. Everyone lords over the other. Everyone uses the other, abuses the other, and uses the other. Moshe wanted to highlight how hopelessly corrupt Egypt was, and Egypt had to be broken. It was irredeemable. It had to be broken on every level because it was such a corrupt, decadent society that was so out of touch with the reality, so out of touch with the reality of Hashem. When you're out of touch with the reality, that's why you have to have 10 plagues. If you're out of touch with the reality that Hashem creates the world with 10 utterances, 
So it had to be broken on every level. Because when you're out of touch with Hashem, you're out of touch with people. And that's why you enslave people and you lord over people and you it's all about power and control, the chutzpah, the arrogance, the hubris that we're seeing today is just mind boggling, just boggles the mind. Who do you think you are? Controlling and, 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 and. but this is Pari gets that's that's Pari. King of Egypt, king of ego, absolute hubris, absolute arrogance, clueless. Blocking your vision, putting your finger in front of your eye and not seeing anything. Not see, you can't see beyond the tip of your own nose. Completely shut off from reality. The shutting of the mind. And that has to be broken. But it starts with us. When we feel broken heart. When we feel that we have a, a pare moment. When our arrogance and ego is out of control. We have to be broke. And I think today many good people do feel brokenhearted. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> Being brokenhearted is, is, is actually a very healthy thing. Not so bad. <laughs> Maybe a little brokenhearted, a little, a little less arrogant, a little less uh, self-absorbed, a little less egotistical, and a little more... Genuineness, a little more humility, a little more kindness and seeing others and feeling others and empathizing with others and a little more. This is, will spurt our growth. This is the nothingness that, that spurts and generates and creates that bursts the Garden of Eden. When the seed is rotting, then you know that we're getting to the Garden of Eden. All that potential will explode emerge and surface in its full glory. The only difference is that today we live in, in today we with nanotechnology, this will happen in a nanosecond. We don't have to wait thousands of years for this to develop and unfold. Now all of this can unfold and develop literally in a nanosecond. It's like Jackie Mason says, you know, I was a comedian for 40 years and then it became an overnight success. So we've only been working at this for the last 3,800 years. So when Mashiach does come in a nanosecond, yeah, it's like an overnight success. We've only been working at this for 3,800 years. And then in one split second, it all came together. In one split second, we had the actual redemption at hand. But it all begins with Boyal Pari. When Pari is at its height, Hashem tells to Moshe, come with me. When you're in touch with reality, you feel Hashem. Then, when you feel brokenhearted, then you break the para, you break the ego, you break the arrogant, the foolish ego, this, this uh, delusionary sense of self, the inflated sense of self, the completely out of touch sense of self, this false persona that we create, that's a distortion, doesn't in any way reflect who we truly are, our genuine being. And then, then when you break para, then you can have redemption. Then there could be genuine movement. Then there could be positive movement forward. And then we can have the actual, actual redemption. So Hashem should help with this Shabbos, very powerful Shabbos, 71 years, 70 years, the yard site and the day that ever became Rebbe, and after 3,800 years, we should cross the finishing line, bring this home, we should actually merit to see the actual redemption. And uh, the next class, the next class we'll have in the Upper East Side of Yerushalayim, overlooking the third base of Migdash, when we've been, we'll have been totally triumphant, we'll be totally triumphant. And uh, Alter Rebbe says Mashiach will be in the newspapers. It'll be a not total... the times. What? No, not no, the not times. Algamena, Algamena is now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, we should actually uh, read about it and see about it. See it, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if CNN will carry it. You know, maybe. They, <laughs> but that's the sign of Mashiach. Mashiach will come. Everyone will report it, and everyone will carry it, and and even do it willingly, believe it or not. So uh, that will be a total triumph, and um, it's high time that we should triumph, and we should uh, shouldn't just talk about. 
redemption, but we should actually experience redemption and experience it literally in the most tangible way. We should see it with our eyes. And um, may it happen, may it happen now. If anyone has any comments, questions, thoughts, please unmute, unmute yourself. May I ask a question, Rabbi, about today's Parsha? Go ahead. Um, it, it says that, that, that Hashem will smite, and it says that the angel of death will, will smite. And it seems to be a contradiction. I don't understand. So it says, I think the commentaries say that Hashem gave permission for the angel of death. And when, that, when the angel of death has permission to do his work, he doesn't differentiate. So there were many, that's why there were many more people who died, not only the firstborn. Once he was unleashed, like the plague was unleashed, it was unleashed. And it was, in, uh, it was indiscriminatory. It didn't discriminate. And that's why it was a very dangerous time. It was one of the reasons why Hashem quarantined the Jewish people and said, don't leave your house. Um, however, to be able to detect the difference between the Egyptians, the firstborn and not the firstborn, the angels couldn't do it because anyone who was a firstborn, whether it was her firstborn, the mother's firstborn, or whether it was the father's first child, and there was so much, uh, <laughs> there was so much hanky panky going out in Egypt. Egypt was famous for Everest artists. It was, it was a low. There were a bunch of low lights and decadent, very decadent, decadent land. Women married women. Men married. There was gay marriage. Uh, one woman married two men. It was an extremely decadent, backwards, pagan society. It seems like many people want to go back there. And, um, and uh, so it was very difficult to, to know, to detect many years later that this person was really a firstborn. Angels couldn't make that distinction. Only Hashem could, could clearly make all the distinctions and say clearly this is this is a firstborn, this is a first, he's a firstborn, she's a firstborn. In many houses, there were many firstborn because, um, you know, she was adulterous. So maybe it was a lover's firstborn. <laughs> it could be. So that's why many were very confused. You know, only the firstborn was supposed to die. And all of a sudden, people are dying right, left, and center. So Hashem was able, Hashem was distinguished clearly between every firstborn and those who are not firstborn. And actually says something even more ast astonishing and astounding. Hashem said that even the Egyptians that are going to hang out in your house, the firstborn, they will die. And even the Jews who would be hanging out in a non-Jewish home, in a Mitzri's home, that didn't have the blood on the doorposts, and didn't have all of that. Hashem says, I will distinguish between the firstborn Egyptians and that firstborn Jew. He will not die and the Egyptian next to him will die. And you think about it, it's astonishing because you're talking about a Jew who's in such a low place that even after nine plagues, the last night they're in Egypt, they're about to leave Egypt. Everyone is at home. Everyone is quarantined at home. They're offering the Paschal lamb. They circumcise. They're getting ready to leave Egypt. And here you have a Jew who's in such a dark place. He would rather hang out with the Egyptians rather than hang out with his own family, with his own people. It's the last night in Egypt. And Hashem says, I love him. He's a Jew. He's mine. And I still love him unconditionally. And I'm going to redeem him. So the angels, the angels would all say, are you kidding? This bum, this low life, this self-hating Jew. Let him die with all the Egyptians. He made his choice. After nine plagues, after a whole year of miracle and wonders, miracle after miracle, wonder after wonder, and they're about to leave the last night of Egypt, and he, this miserable person, is sitting with the Egyptians, would rather be with the Egyptians, feels more comfortable, more at home with the Egyptians than he does in his own family, in his own home, his own people, his own community. Angels would say, the heck with this person. He goes down with Egypt. 
Hashem says no. I love him unconditionally. He's holy. He's a Jew. He has a holy neshama. He has a holy faith. He's a child of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Racham, Malaya. He has that holy soul. And I love him, and I'm going to personally redeem him. Schlep him out of his inner darkness and his physical darkness. That's only something Hashem can do. Personal. That's the true meaning of redemption. It's person to person. It's very personal. Yiddish guide is deeply personal. That's the difference between Judaism and religion. Judaism is based on redemption. Hashem personally redeemed us, cares about us, loves us. It's very personal. It's very deeply personal. It's not just going through rituals and customs and abstract and heavenly or the worldly. It's, it's very real. And we can't help but reciprocate Hashem's love back to Hashem in return. Hashem loves us and we love Hashem. It's very personal. It's very deeply personal. We take our Yiddishkeit very personally. Thank you. Everyone have a beautiful, beautiful Shabbos. If you're in town, please join us. We're having a dinner tomorrow night and we're going to have a grand kiddush and a whole Shabbaton celebrating this very, very special day. Um, so if you're in Upper East Side of Shabbos, please, please join us. Uh, we're going to have the Siddur class next week. Please God at 6.30 in person and on Zoom. And uh, next week we'll talk about Tu Bishvat uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday's class at 7.30. Remember to eat uh, some uh, nice fruits next week. Uh, make a blessing and uh, fruits. Eat the fruits, especially the fruits that Israel is blessed. Make a chef, etc. Next to Wednesday night and Thursday. Everyone have a good Chavez. Thank you. Good Chavez, Rabbi.